For the company I worked for that went public, I was there in 86 when they launched their flagship product and I heard all the great stories and things they were going to do about it. And I can honestly tell you they got to the grand vision 27 years later. Move over, baby boomers. It's time for Gen XYZ. It's time to stop waiting on the world to change. It's time to be the change. It's time to stop thinking about how your life can be better. It's time to start taking action, massive action to improve your life. Join Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios every week as we learn how others had the grit, determination, and conviction to 10x their lives, and as we explore ways that can help you 10x your life. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the 10x for Gen XYZ podcast. I'm Zach Winner. And I'm Mark Adair Rios. And today, as our guest, we have Hall Martin. Hall is the founder and CEO of 10 Capital which has over 5,000 investors in its network. And he's helped startups raise over $644 million. He also serves as the vice chair of the Baylor Angel Network and hosts the Investor Connect podcast, which is focused on investing in startups and growth companies. Paul, welcome to the podcast. We're really glad to have you. Well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, maybe we could start out by, you know, just having you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about your background and how you got into investing in in startups and growth companies? Sure. So when I was in high school, my father started to get me involved in investing. And we would uh, look at different stocks and try to analyze them and put money into them. And then we started looking at sector funds. And over the years, I just kept moving up the curve from one funding mechanism to the next or one investment opportunity to the next. And then at some point in that process, you come to angel investing. So investing in public companies, you start investing in private companies. And I was in Austin at the time, and we had a, an angel network called the Capital Network that ran from 95 to 2002. And I, I came to Austin in 1984 to go to graduate school and then 86 went to work for a company that later went IPO'd in 1995. And so I started thinking, well, now's the time to start investing in uh, private companies because I'm here in Austin. They have a great angel network and let's, let's go and invest. So I put money into one deal and two years later, lost all of it and started to realize that this is harder than it looks. And that group ran from 95 to 2002. They were tied into the dot-com world. And when that went away, they went away with it. And so I started doing some angel investing with some friends for a couple of years. And then the city did a restart for their angel network here in Austin called, they called it the Central Texas Angel Network, CTAN. And I was the first member to sign up for it. And when you're the first member to sign up, you're automatically on the board in charge of membership. It's a great honor, no pay, but it's a great honor anyway. And so I ended up recruiting about 50 members and got about 5 million invested in 20 deals. And we ended up with about a 42X return for those initial investors. And so that propelled the group onward. And then my undergraduate, Baylor, asked for help in putting together an angel network out of their university. So I went and joined them and started putting that together and have helped, I'm still a member of that group here today. And then I had a third group ask me for an angel network in Williamson County. We called it the Wilco Angel Network. And so I had a lot of fun doing these angel groups. And along about 2000. I decided it was, uh, I'd been at my company for over 25 years and decided, well, you know, that's enough fun. Let's, uh, let's get back to the early stage world because that company turned into a big company. It's all about budgets, forecasts, and those type of things. And I, at heart, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship, innovation, early stage work. And so I wanted to get back to it and was having more fun with the angel work than I was with the day job. So I retired and I started my company under the name Texas Entrepreneurs Network. And we were helping startups raise funding primarily from angels in Texas and had the idea of doing open angel networks instead of going into these closed membership groups. I had the thesis that uh, in any city in Texas, one out of 10,000 people was an angel investor. Lubbock has 100,000 people at the time, so there were 10 angel investors, and we were doing funding forums and roadshows around the state. There was just one problem. Texas is a big state, and we were driving everywhere, so I decided to move all that online and started taking advantage of the web and kept, kept growing the investment uh, pool there. So that's how I got into investing and then kind of slid from personal investing into making it more of my career to make those investments and to help others make those investments as well. Nice. Really interesting. Um, what, what types of companies are you investing in? Are they primarily mm. tech related? And is there a difference between a startup and a growth company or are those kind of used interchangeably? 
Well, there's a lot of startups out there. And one thing I discovered when I started working with the startup scene is people would say you work with startups, but you know, to your point, there's many, many different kinds of startups. I actually did a, a, a startup class for eight companies when I first uh, started Texas Entrepreneurs Network. And what I discovered is, is that every, every company needs three things. They need a network, they need mentorship, and they need funding. If I have a home-based business, that's one type of network, funding and mentorship. If I have a high-tech growth firm, that's a very different network mentorship and funding model. And so, and there's probably 50 to 100 different types of deals out there, uh, women-led businesses, consumer product businesses, high-tech growth, home-style businesses, lifestyle businesses, and, and there's just many other variations on it because there are so many and, and they have different types. And I, I, when I ran the class, I ended up with eight companies and they were all different. And so they all needed a different network, a different mentorship, and a different funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so it was just very hard to get traction around it. And that's when I learned that you really have to choose your sector very carefully because to get any sort of depth or a critical mass behind it, you're going to have to align everybody around one network, one mentorship, one funding model. And then, then you can do classes and accelerators and so forth. And over the years, I've done several accelerators. I helped start the accelerator in Austin called SKU now, but back then it was called Incubation Station. It was for consumer product goods. And they had certain mentorship, networking, and funding needs. And then I started one in Dallas called Accelerate NFC for near-field near communication, where you have chips that through proximity can communicate. And so we did one for those. And so we, we did a lot of uh, effort in building the entrepreneur ecosystems in Texas back in those days. Well, that's really interesting. So the way you go about, at least through this process of of investing in companies is you put together these incubators to do more than just provide funding, but to provide advice, counsel, mentorship on how to grow the company. Is that right? Right. So when I started Texas Entrepreneurs Network, there were two accelerators in all of Austin. I think today there's probably one in every other corner downtown. <laughs> and so, and there's many online as well. So there's plenty of them here. But if you're ever starting a, an entrepreneur ecosystem from scratch, and this is what I did back in the mid 2006, seven and eight timeframe is you, first of all, you uh, identify all the resources in the area for startups, anything that comes out of the university, Anything that anybody's doing for an accelerator incubator, any training programs, any funding mechanisms, anything. And when I was in Austin, I actually you know couldn't find that list. It was very hard to find the startup world if you don't have that. And so I created the list. I called it the Austin Entrepreneur Ecosystem and had over a hundred different groups here that did something with startups. They may not be exclusive, but they did something with it. Professional services, the lawyers that were relevant to it, the accountants, the all the, all the groups that were there, and put that together, and it became kind of the the place people went to find to find the startup scene, so to speak. So, in a, in, over the years, many people have come to Austin saying, "What should we do first? And I say, "You know, the inventory the resources in your community, figure out what startups need, and then go fill in the parts that aren't there yet. Go mm -hmm. recruit others to come in to fill the gaps that may be there, because the startups always have needs, and they don't always align with what happens to be there right now. And the the last thing you want to do is have people duplicate things. You know, come up with two or three of the same." No, let's just spread out and cover the white spaces that are in our group. And if you come up with that map, so to speak, you'll find that that really propels your ecosystem forward. So you're putting together these groups and it's more of like a collegial atmosphere where people could come to the group and have various resources to help grow their businesses and including mentorship, including potential financing. As an angel investor, our um, are you formalizing a requirement to, for example, be on the board so you, that you can help formally steer the business in a direction that you think will help grow the business? In some cases, it's formal, but in many cases, it's informal. But I agree, if you're going to invest in a startup, you should really think about hard about how you can help that startup and, and work with startups that you can help. You know, the, the saying among angel investors is that they want to do a little good, have a little fun and make a little money. And when I look at the deals that were truly successful, they were hitting on all three of those points. It wasn't just making money, but we were also doing some good. In other words, we were uh, being very helpful to the startup in some 
some ways and we were having fun, which means they were good people to work with. So you always want to hit all three of those if you can. In the early stage, most angels are in the go to market phase. They often come in before VCs because there's a little, just a little bit of revenue, but not a lot. And so it's probably a little bit too soon to have formal boards, but informal advisory boards are really a good thing to put together. Hmm, interesting. Great. So I, I'm glad you talked about a little bit of the timeline. <clears throat> so just kind of clue me in on, on how it works. So angel investors are really the pretty much the first ones in aside from the actual entrepreneur putting their own money into their, their company, right? And it, that, those are usually the smaller dollars kind of starting out. Um, talk to me just about what, you know, what are the steps to get all the way up to say a, a funding stage, like an actual funding stage where you have a viable business that's moving on um, with that. Sure. So we always recommend, you know, people, you know, they're putting money into it, but they don't usually actually put it into a bank account and formally count it. But I always say, do that, put money into a bank account and really run it like a business from day one. And investors will look to see how much skin you have in the game for it if you're a startup. And so if you've actually put money in 20, 30, 40, 50K, you know, write that down and make that a part of the equation. And then you start spending the circle out wider. You know, your family and friends will put money in to help grow it. And you, it's good to have a little bit of money from there as well. Mm -hmm. And then you start going to friends of friends. And then at some point, you're, you're now talking to angel investors because they are not family and friends. And so they start asking harder questions. As you get further away from yourself and family, uh, it, it becomes more of a what's in the business versus, you know, how much do I know you? And so you have to just start building up from there. At some point, you need to start engaging with customers. In fact, uh, most people tell me they're not going to go talk to a customer until after they have a product. And I think, well, maybe we should be talking to a customer before we build the product so we build the right thing. And whenever you talk to investors, that's what you always do is bring up what are customers saying? We went out to this client, they have a problem, we think we can solve it. We went back, we proposed, they, they think they like it. We went back, we closed a 50K contract with them. Now, if you're an investor, this is what you want to hear. Here. You know, customers are getting involved early. You're, they're guiding you on what to build versus I had this great idea. I built it and now I'm raising money to go out and sell it to somebody. I don't know who. Uh, that's, the, that's the story they get worried about because if you don't have a customer involved, you can build the wrong thing. And so that's, that's why we always want to have a customer in the discussion. Even if you don't have it built yet, they should be in there talking to you about the problem they have and potentially having them help fund it as well. So after you have family and friends and you have some angels, the next thing you want to do is have some customers customers funded. And the way we do this is, you know, if you're making a standard product you want to sell for say $5,000 each, you know, what you do is go find three customers that will pay you $100,000 each because they want a custom version of that. And we call those anchor customers or anchor clients where they want something unique and special, but you're going to go and build it for them on your standard code base, you know, standard architecture, not doing anything that's just unique to them. Everything is, has to be in line with what you want to build. Mm -hmm. And after your third customer, you have a standard product with customer feedback in it that the customer have paid the majority of, maybe not all of it, but a good chunk of it. And now you have some market reality in this product. Customers mm -hmm. are happy and they're paying for it. Now you're ready for the market and or to go to uh, institutional funding, you know, venture capital and start just saying, I raised all this money. What, what VCs are looking for down the road is validation. If you, know, you put money in, your family put money in, customers put money in, this is a great thing. I do have people coming to me from other parts of the country and they say, hey, nobody back home would give me money. How about you? Uh, <laughs> this, this is not validation. This is not going to work. Uh, and I, I, I get that a lot. You know, nobody back home would pay. pay. Well, that, that's, that's, this is going to be tough because uh, why wouldn't they not put money in? And sure enough, they don't usually have a product. They haven't, uh, don't know the market very well. And there's, there's too many holes. And so we have to go back and start over and, and, and get those validation points covered. But that that's how you do it. You, you start small and you grow it and you do validation. The key is to think minimum. In the early days when you're building a product, I get a lot of this, especially from later stage entrepreneurs where they, they want this big, grand, glorious vision as beautiful and so forth, but they only need $10 million to go build it. Uh, okay, this is going to be tough because, you know, we, we, we start small and we grow it over time. And so up front, we're thinking minimum. What's the minimum viable product? What's the minimum team? What's the minimum uh, fundraise that we need to make this work uh, to prove it and build it up? And, and it is, it, what you're building is usually not the grand vision. It's a faint 
resemblance of it. And some, some entrepreneurs have a hard time with that. You know, they, they really want that on day one. But, the, you know, the company I worked for that went public, I was there in 86 when they launched their flagship product. And I heard all the great stories and things they were going to do about it. And I can honestly tell you, they got to the grand vision. 27 years later, <laughs> it, it was, it is a long time to get to the final grand vision It's yeah. beautiful when you get there, but it's not there on day one. It's never yeah. there on day one. If it is, it's, it's really not grand or a vision for sure. How do you, it's such a long path to get to that point where you've reached your grand vision or you're getting bought out or you have an initial public offer off, offering. How do you deal with valuation and what are you getting in exchange for investing at an early stage? Sure, so with valuation, it's all about um, you know, uh, negotiations. It's not just a formula. And the typical formulas don't work anyway. Discounted cash flows and those things you normally see in accounting don't really work for startups. And so I came out with my rule of four, which means I'll, I'll give you a million dollars of valuation for each of these four things, sales, team, product, and intellectual property. So if sales are all working and everything's clicking and going well and products going out the door on a regular basis, I'll give you, give you a million dollars for that. If we're, if we're not having a lot of sales, but we have a, uh, you know, uh, some you know, trials and discounted buys and so forth, well, maybe I'll give you $500,000 for it. Team, if everybody's in place, a million dollars. If half the team is in place, $500,000. Uh, product, if the product is fully shipping and working, a million dollars. If we're in beta and it kind of works for some people, well, maybe $300,000. Intellectual property, if everything is uh, patented and warded, a million dollars. If we have five provisional patents filed, well, let's call that 250. You then go through and you add up all of those numbers and that's your valuation. And the, the, the exercise is not to come up with a formula, but to identify the values in the business. Business. And that's whenever, whatever number a startup puts out to an investor as a valuation, no matter what it is, the investor is going to say the same thing. How did you arrive at that? And what they're looking for is justification. And half the time, the answer I get back is, well, I just think I'm worth that. And <laughs> well, it's well, a billion I, dollar market. We're going to capture the, the whole billion dollars of, of that market. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, so the idea is you have to go back and say, well, look at the team I built, look at the product I have, look at the property. And you have to, you have to justify it by identifying those values. But you're right. One of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make is they want tomorrow's valuation today. You know, a company in my industry just went public for, you know, 15, you know, $150 million. Therefore, I must be worth $50 million today. Well, no, that's, that's, you'll be worth $50 million in the future. But today, your valuation is what you're worth today, which is probably a far less than $50 million. And you have to work your way up to that. What I love about this, oh, just real quick, I was just going to say what I love about this, this kind of four steps, you know, to valuation, it really just goes back to fundamentals. You don't have to be a Warren Buffett and do value investing like you would try to, you know, try to apply those rules to an in-place business that's already running. But this is something very, very similar where you're kind of attaching some real kind of value-based metrics to each of these things. That's right, because you're, you're negotiating, and you yeah. have to remember that. It's, it's always negotiation. Many entrepreneurs are surprised when they put out a number and they get pushback. They, they never expected pushback. And I tell them, you should always expect pushback and you should be ready to uh, negotiate. And it's something that you have to carry forward with. That, that's one of the rules I have for startups is you never show up to the investor discussion empty handed. You always have some value you're bringing. A customer just gave you great advice. A customer just bought something. Your team just built something. Uh, we, we have a, we just hired new team members. We got a check from another investor. There's something that's is a value add that's there. So you have new information for the investor and you just don't show up with an idea. Everybody shows up with an idea that, that goes nowhere. It's really, you're showing that you're actually executing towards the goal. Nice. Interesting. What, what are the different ways in which you can invest as an angel investor? For example, you take an equity slug, you have debt, Maybe you have debt convertible to equity. And, and how do you protect yourself against dilution from when the company goes out and does another round of fundraising? Right. Well, in many ways, you're, you should expect dilution if it's going the long haul. You know, they, you know, to make the pie bigger, you, know, you have to have more money, more team. And so you just have to have a good, good system going there. And you should be ready, recognizing that you will be diluted down at some point. 
Uh, but the, the key there is, you know, typically we start with convertible notes or safe notes because they're simple. Uh, you don't make the investor decline the pay, uh, the valuation paywall, I call it, which is what, what, what exactly is everything worth? Because in the very early days, that can be really hard to figure out and agree upon. So convertible notes are just debt instruments that convert to equity later, and we'll, we'll, we'll put the valuation on it. You do want a valuation cap, so it can't go too far off. Mm -hmm. But the idea is you start with those, and then at some point, you, a lead investor will come in and put a valuation on it that, that everybody agrees with. And then we have a priced round and then we carry it forward from there. And so that's one thing to consider too. You don't want to you know, get your valuation too far ahead of yourself. During the pandemic, the, the market was all-time highs. And so valuations were all-time highs. And yeah. today, many of those all-time highs are not looking so reasonable anymore. And people are having down rounds and, and cutting in a big way because it was way ahead. So whenever you raise a round of funding, the question is not, can I raise this round at that valuation? But rather, if I do, can I raise the next round at the next valuation? And you have to think about that. I want the valuation to double you know, one round over the next. Next, but if it doubles, we'll, what, what, what is the revenue expectation? Can I meet that revenue expectation on the next round? If you don't think so, well, then you're, you're getting ahead of yourself, you know, pull it back. And people think they're getting away with something until the, the market turns down like we are now. And uh, we're really not getting away with anything. We, we have a problem. So you always want to keep your valuation on a steady track for sure. What, what types of um, returns in aggregate are you looking for? Like if it was like a, a batting average scenario and you invested in say 10 companies are you, you hoping for you know a, a couple singles a couple doubles a triple maybe a home run or how do you how do you approach that sure so you know the, the rule is that and i've seen this uh, play out over and over again uh you know one out of ten is a home run it's really great uh two or three are one to three x returns maybe a five x in there uh, one went bankrupt, it's completely dead. And the, the other five are now lifestyle businesses. You'll get something out of it, but you probably won't get much more than your original investment back, if anything. So that's, that's the rule. You know, you have 10, 15 and 75, you know, 10 is the top 1%. The, the, the three to five X returns are, you know, the next, uh, 15% and then the bottom next 25% are probably, you know, you just get your money back and the bottom 50%, uh, you, you'll never get anything back it just goes away so and that, that that applies to venture capital funds that applies to angel funding and uh, when we get the numbers from crowdfunding i think we'll see the same thing there as well okay how does it work in terms of cash flow i mean you had mentioned like convertible notes and then also equity if it's a convertible note are you getting um some type of uh, periodic distribution for as interest on the note uh if not i mean what do you what are you looking for is that you're not going to get really any significant returns until there's a capital event like a sale of the company or an IPO? That's pretty much it. Uh, any interest rate or uh, dividends and whatever are accrued, not, not paid out. They're accumulated. So there's really no cash being paid out. And uh, realize we're in, the, we're in the venture world. And so what the implied agreement here is that the startup's going to live on ramen noodles for the next five years to make this a big return. And the investors are going to live without interest uh, payments or dividends or royalties because we're trying to make it a big payout. But having said that, I, I found that, you know, half these businesses turn into lifestyle businesses along the way and have been burned by that many times. I put money in and, uh, you know, 10 years later, I get 50% return on my money, but, you know, no real return for that. And we measure it in IRR, internal rate of return, which is basically return on investment with respect to time. The faster I get my money back, the better the number is. And that's what professionals use is IRR, not uh, return on investment. And so that's what we're looking for is you're looking for somebody that will pay back sooner rather than later. And the lifestyle business ultimately many ways does, but it's so far out there and it's so small, it, it really isn't in the venture world that we had hoped it would be. And so to that end, I came up with my own term sheet, I call 3X and 3. And because at year three of my investment, that's when people, the CEO in most cases came to me and they either said, hey, we're raising another round because we're growing, you want to invest, or they're telling me, I think we should take all of our members and employees to market rate salaries because they work so hard. And the first time I heard that, I was, I, I was 
great cognitive dissonance came over to me. It <laughs> sounded right. It sounded like, yeah, we should pay them more until I realized, oh, wait, we're all supposed to be living on ramen noodles to make this a big <laughs> equity exit. What's going on here? Well, what's happening is that they are exiting the venture track that you are on as an investor, and they're entering the payroll track, which you are not on. And they're just basically going to cash flow out the uh, return through salaries. Mm -hmm. And I invested in, in, a, in a company once in 2003. And uh, basically, uh, if you're three, they came and said they wanted to go to market rate salaries. They did. And uh, I eventually, you know, 10 years later, got 50% return on my money. But I estimated the management team took out over $3 million in the form of salaries in the remaining years because they just jumped up the uh, payout rate. And there was a little bit of a return, but not much. And so as an investor, you, you watch out for businesses that are going to turn into a lifestyle business. And a 3X and 3 basically says that year three, you have a redemption right. You can get three extra money. It turns to a revenue share agreement from there on and you get paid out of the revenue or it um, you forego that and you go on the cap table as an equity investor for what you put in. So there's lots of new term sheets coming out that are trying to solve those problems. Yeah. And and that um, that's a really great point. And I, I've actually seen, I think it was on LinkedIn, but I've seen a lot of pushback on this, this whole, you know, late stage angel kind of early VC rounds where <clears throat> they're putting in these big salaries for these developers, you know, and things like that. And, and investors are starting to push back on that. Like, Hey, we don't want to fund your salaries. You should be eating ramen noodles, you know? <laughs> and, and so, and, and is there, is there a possibility for a liquidity event? Say you as an angel investor and you know, the values there, do you want to stay on past the VC rounds or is there a possibility to get out with like a recapitalization with, with VC money? Yeah, there's, there's many, many, many VCs are happy for angels to take an exit if it's not too much uh, before they come in to clean up the cap table. And you have to look for deals that are going down that path where it, they call it an early exit, where you're getting three to five times your money. You're not trying to get 10 to 20 uh, to get to, to the, the bigger payoff. You have to be in the deal for 10, 15 years. And then then bad things can happen. You can be diluted. You can be worked out of the system in a big way. So, you know, taking an early exit is one way to get out. If I can get three to five times money in three to five years, that could be a very fruitful uh, exercise in getting uh, cash flowed out in these deals. So that's that's one thing to consider. And you're using the VC's valuation in order to to kind of get there, correct? Right, because the idea is they're going to buy you out at yeah. the uh, next institutional round, either Series A or Series B, that they're going to take you out uh, for some meaningful three to five X return. And if you're in that category, that's usually not hard to negotiate. Right. As, as we're moving into a possible recession, are you kind of taking a, a reevaluation or a, a reanalysis about how you're evaluating companies to potentially invest in? Well, certainly investors I deal with are, you know, the market's gone down by 20, 30% for the very late stage. During the pandemic, especially in the Series B and C, you know, in the unicorn track and so forth, they were at hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, there's nowhere, they're nowhere near that now. So they have to come back down. And, and most startups should know that, that, you know, investors are tying the startup valuation market to the actual stock market. And at heart, it goes back to the M&A. What, what will a company pay for this business? Is it five times revenue or 10 times revenue? What, what will they actually pay? And when the market goes down, those numbers go down. When the market goes up, those numbers go up. And so you have to you know, stay in tune with that to realize that's what the market is. And you can't control that. You just have to ride that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The interesting, interesting point on that, that just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, you know, Sequoia Partners came out with their Adapting to Endure um, 52 pages of you know, <laughs> um, just kind of talking about the state of the economy, but what was really interesting was at least stuck out to me, this whole idea that there's no more free money, right? All the free money that has been going on in the last two years that were helping those valuations really kind of skyrocket. It's all gone. And so we really have to recession or not, we have to really start making sure that we keep in mind that things are just going to be a lot more expensive on, uh, on the money side, equity and debt. Right. Well, that's how it was before the pandemic. Uh, it was not easy to raise funding. You had to convince people. People had only so much dry powder to put into startups as well. 
And during the pandemic, uh, of course, with the market going up, there was always more stock to sell and more to put into startups and you could keep that going. But when, when that went away, you know, now you hear investors say, I, only, I, I don't have five checks to write anymore, I have two. So they're very careful about which two it goes out to because uh, they just can't sell more stock. That, that went away for sure. So it's back to what I would call the normal now. Pandemic was not a normal way of operating. It was a dot-com level bubble in most many ways, but we're back to normal, which is great because there was a lot of noise in the market too. When I everybody and the brother was starting a business and raising funding and you're, you're now having to sift through all that stuff to try to find the, the real startups. Interesting. Paul, oh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how, how your company 10 Capital works and how you work with investors and are you aggregating funds to, to invest in particular companies? So we call ourselves funding as a service and we're helping startups find investors and we're helping uh, angel groups and syndicates find members and we're helping VC funds find limited partners. So at heart, we're an investment relations services. I started in 2009 having a, a substantial network of angel and venture capital funds. And when I looked at the broker model, I found I was going to lose most, uh, if not all of the uh, angel groups and VC funds because they have rules against brokers being in the deal. They can't have money going out for the transaction for various reasons. So I went the retainer model and went after the, the hard part of it, which was just getting the introduction, uh, just finding the right investor and getting the dialogue going was the, the, the biggest part that most startups had after family and friends and your local angel group, now what? And my thesis was, is that you really have to have a national perspective on your fundraise from day one, and you should get money from the local group. You know, you should, even if it's not a lot, you should get it to say, well, the local group put money in, but now we're raising more versus the local group would not put money in. Mm -hmm. But once you got to that point, most people had no idea where to go after that. And we that's what we did was curate all the angel groups. There's over 200 in the US, all the crowdfunding platforms, all the VC funds, all the, the 4,000 micro VC funds that are now out there as well, which deal in the early stage as well. So that, that was our, our effort was to kind of capture all of that. And then for funds raising from limited partners, it was mostly family offices. You get to a $100 million uh, fund, you can start to raise from pension funds and those institutions. But the vast majority were $25, $50 million funds. And you really can't raise from pension funds. It's, they're too big. And so you have to go to family offices and high net worths. And so we curated a list of people there as well. So just networking and knowing where everybody is and then being able to make introductions is the, 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 the way we approach the uh, process as well. Are you um, or is 10 Capital uh, forming these 25 to 50 million dollar funds and then and then working with the networking group to, to fund it? Well, what we're doing is finding the people that have 25 and 50 million dollar funds every day. Somebody wants to start another fund. It was someone who did well with an angel group or just personally did well with financing and fundraising and uh, funding. And so they want to professionalize it, you know, put a management fee on it and a carry and then go out and start to uh, do it at a bigger way. And to get a bigger salary, you have to raise a bigger fund. And to get a bigger fund, you have to prove a track record that you know how to pick winners. And so that's what we're doing is helping those people find a uh, way to tell their story, show the track record and get out in front of family offices and high net worths in order to raise more funds to carry on the mission. If you're picking winners and they're going well, you can work your way up. I've seen people go from 10 to 20, to 25 to 35 to 50 to 65 to 85 and on up to $100 million. Take several years to get there because you have to raise the money, deploy it, and show the, pro the progress, and then go raise more money on that. And it helps to have a unique investment thesis as well. I found that's the two things investors look for is a track record that you have a numerical advantage, and two, you have a unique thesis that you have access to that deal flow. And that's where family offices in 2016 came into my network at, in great uh, numbers because they wanted to do deals direct. And what we found is, is that if you can understand the space and you have access to deal flow, yes, you can do it yourself. But there are many sectors that are not that easy. Blockchain in the 2017 and 18 timeframe, the ICO phase of it was very hard to sort out the real from the not real. And so most people just put money into funds they thought would do better. And then uh, you, you, the technology was still very nascent. It's starting to come into focus as to what it can do. And so you're seeing people invest directly more now than they did back then. But that's something to consider is uh, do, you, do you have access to those deals and uh, do you understand that, that space well enough to do that? Mm. Are you, um, so, <clears throat> so it sounds like you're doing very high level consulting 
uh, in, in a lot of ways, right? Uh, bringing the parties together. And on the operator side, are you doing any kind of education or help people get their packages together to, to be able to put in front of um, these groups more effectively, like pitch deck, review, and, and, and things like that? Do you, is that kind of a, you know, a fee for service type of thing that you guys offer? Yeah, for starters, raising funding from uh, angels or VCs, we we help them with the deck if they needed, and you know there's there's standard things that need to be in the deck, and most of the deals that come to me have that, but if they don't, we we help them get that ready, and then we put a, a, a data room together, or what they call a due diligence box, so uh, all the basic documents are in one place, so this is not going to be a paper chase for the investor, and we come together looking like we're we're a little bit more put together as well, and then we also coach on you know this the fundraising strategy. We, what we found is that we can take a deal and reposition it for different investors. If you have a service like education technology, you can go out to ed tech investors and position it that way. If it's a recurring revenue model, there are other investors that want recurring revenue. We can reposition it for those guys. And just by putting the right terms on the mailer that describe what this is for CAC LTV ratio and the other recurring revenue metrics. And then many of them have an impact, a social impact or otherwise. And so we're making clear what that is. And we're going out to yet a different group. So you can customize this a little bit for the investor you're going to and we help with that a lot that's great and are you um are you I, I keep working using the word consulting it's probably not the right word but are you working for equity typically or are you just kind of fee based on, on right now we're, we're we're fee based because if you take anything on uh success fee you have to have a broker's license and that that was the issue we got into is we chose not to be a broker because we wanted to keep our network which we get now access to everybody not just a, a number of people mm -hmm. and so that's why we just we have a retainer model but everything's included and we we put advisory as a part of that so when they need help with whatever we're coaching and that's just part of the process great 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 really interesting uh, before the podcast, you had mentioned uh, possible new developments in structure uh, with with DAOs. Maybe you could talk a little bit about about that and what's going on there. Sure. You know, if you look at the the startup equity crowdfunding world, Reg CF they call it. Um, you know, these are closed portals that someone owns the data. And when you go on there as a startup, you run a campaign. I think most startups have the illusion that the portal is going to do the majority of the work, but the portal is not doing the majority of the work. You're doing the majority of the work. You have to bring the network. And what network you don't bring, you're going to have to pay for it with social media and marketing ad spend. Ad spend used to be 10, 15% of the fundraise, but in some cases I heard it go up to 20, 25% of the fundraise, which is quite expensive for fundraising. But if you're trying to get five, 10, 15 million dollars, that's what it will take. And what, what, what was missing from this is the network. And what distributed autonomous organizations, Web3 applications are bringing, is uh, communities where everybody is in the system, investors, customers, partners, advisors, uh, the whole community is there. And what you're doing is you're aligning incentives with tokens. So if you invest, you get tokens. If you buy the product, you get tokens or you use tokens to buy the product, something like that. And then if somebody's promoting a deal or raising funding or bringing people in, they get incentivized to work as well because we're all organized around a common cause. So what you're actually doing is building the network that the startup needs to go raise funding because they go out to that group and say, I'm doing X. And the group as a whole through voting decides what we're going to do. We're going to give you tokens or we're not. We're going to, you're going to merit those tokens for your startup or you're not. And, and, and the data is all there. You, you don't have to go find the network. The network is already there. You don't have to, um, uh, you know, you understand who, who you have to go convince. And one of the challenges in the ICO phase of the uh, blockchain world in 2017 and 18 is that most of those things were controlled by two, three, five people. And strangely enough, the answer to every problem was check the money out for ourselves. And so that was a bit of a problem. When you have a DAO, you know, everybody votes. Every, every decision has to be voted on. You don't have to vote for everything, but if you want to, you can. And for things that make a difference, how we're going to spend money or let people in or whatever, you, you, you have a voice in that. And so now it's not controlled by a small group of people. It's controlled by the majority. You can get concentrated holdings of people in there. And that's one thing to look out 
Dow for? Is the Dow truly a Dow? Uh, is truly distributed? Is truly autonomous? Is uh, a, a network that everybody has a voice and it counts? But the idea is you'll you'll see people moving into that model because all the data is in one in one place. Everybody has access to it. You're not you know, missing anything, and everybody gets a chance to decide where it goes. So I think that's going to be the next generation of fundraising is on these DAOs. And so we're starting to look at some of the tools. They're nascent. They're early right now. We're planning to run some campaigns in the fall with some initial tools to try it out. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see uh, because one of the big issues, and I just learned this recently, it's actually a little bit more informed than I am, but one of the big issues with all of these kind of coins or tokens is you know, the, the, the founders or the initial people putting money in, they're able to kind of print their own money you know, and have a stockpile of these coins. And if it takes off, well, they're, you know, they're, they're making money. So it'd be very interesting to see how this, that's kind of taken care of in the DAO world. And I would imagine there's some sort of vote on caps on how many tokens or coins are able. So putting a scarcity principle inside, inside the organization, right? Yeah, this, we get into the tokenomics of it, and that's, that's really the key factor is how, do you, how much do you give people as an incentive? How many tokens do you mint to begin with? How many do you burn so you don't create inflation? How many you know, you, do you put out for the various different aspects? One of the new angles that brings into a startup is now what's called the treasury function, tokens that are kept on the side over here till we have a later stage of funding, now you have to put in, you actually have to manage a treasury. And that mm. brings compliance and rules that you know, most startups don't deal with. Some people just mint tokens, but they don't give it a dollar value. So they they, they get this like uh, frequent flyer miles and points and loyalty programs, but you, know, you, you don't have any uh, uh, regulatory issues that come with it. But if you do put a dollar value, you know that that's future money you can enact into the uh, system, which gives you some real strength for what you can do. Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. Um, so you also run a podcast. Um, tell our listeners a little bit about your podcast. So I run a podcast called Investor Connect, and I, I came to it in about 2013. Uh, as I talked to angel groups, I found one of the biggest complaints they had was there's no institutional memory in my group. And what happens with angel investor is somebody comes in, they're new at this, they make a lot of mistakes in the first couple of years. Second, you know, years three and four, they start making less mistakes, but still some. And years five and six, they start to really get it down and understand how to do it. And year seven and eight, they retire and go on to something else. And so here comes the next group, and they're going through the same process, learning all the same mistakes over again. So my goal was to capture what, what investors did, mostly angels, but later VCs and family offices, as to how they invest, what they invest in. And there's a great deal of institutional knowledge. We have about 650 interviews up there we've done over the years where you can log on and listen to what people invest in, how they invest, what they look for. A lot of common themes that you would expect to come through on it, but uh, they, they're short podcasts, 20, 30 minutes, and they're great ways to learn about how to invest. I have had partners and uh, startups on there as well for their sectors and what's going on, but primarily it's about investors. We originally called it Angel Connect, but I changed the name to Investor Connect because I wanted to do more investors. I've had just quite a few people come on that were really great and fascinating to me. That's great. That's great. You know, we're, um, you know, part of our, just, just part of our, I guess, mandate is to figure out ways to exponentially grow. And I can see angel investing being part of that, especially, I don't know. I mean, you tell me like, like where in a, an investor's journey would, would they, if they're thinking about all the things that they could allocate to, right, their fidelity account, maybe a little syndicated real estate, things like that, would you put you know, starting out as an angel investor with smaller sums, something that, that they could do, or do they need to wait till they have 200, 300, $400,000 to really um, viably enter the space? Yeah, typically you're putting in 3% of your, your investable income into angel or venture because you have to look at it and think, I may never see this money again. And sometimes that's actually turned out to be the case. Yeah. Uh, and then if you're doing it uh, as a career, then you can move up to five or 10%. Usually it's not much more than that, but the, you're right. You put some money aside, but what, you, what you'll see is that a lot of people, you know, to get diversification, you have to be in 10 deals. So they'll come in with 
you know, when I, I was doing this in the, the, the nineties at that capital network, people were standing up asking for $5 million because that's what it took to start a web business. Mm. You know, mm. back then you had to pay, you know, American wages for everything. You know, there was no AWS. You had to build your own server farm. Uh, so it was expensive to stand up a website and so forth by 2005 or six, when we started C10, we, um, you know, that cost had gone down by a factor of 10. And so the average investment was 500 K because you can go and had a lot more business services and so forth. And for some businesses, you know, apps and so forth, it's gone down even more, but the idea is you can actually go and raise money, uh, to, uh, fund those businesses, but you, you want to have, you have to raise, you know, be in 10 deals. So if I, I have a million dollars, I can put a hundred K in each of 10 deals. If I only have a hundred thousand dollars, I can only put 10 K in each of those deals on average. And so that's what you're doing is you're going through and uh, spreading your money across 10 deals with an investment thesis to get a hit or a couple of hits out of it as well. And with many of these online portals today, they'll let you invest for as low as a hundred dollars. Even angel syndicates and angel groups will let you come in for a lot lower amount. Hmm. So when I, we ran CTAN, most people came with a 50 K check, look around the room and then hand it to one person. Well, today they came with a 50 K check and they go five for you, five for you, five for you, five for you. And they, they're spreading it across more people. And when you're going through online portals, and web interfaces that's that's very easy to do at this point right are, are most of these 506c offerings were there or 506b offerings uh most are 506 uh, uh b or c offerings but they're you know we still have a lot of just 506d offerings uh if you're online and everybody's accredited you, you still don't have to do the b or the c mm -hmm. but if you want to want to take up a, a billboard on i-35 well then you you need to had that. I found very few people actually opted for that at the end of the day because there was just too many rules around it. It was just too complicated to have that extra advantage. We'll just stay with people that we know are accredited or in our network and so forth. So those rules are there, but I don't think they're used that much. So, so I'm talking about those 10 deals being spread out. So it would be a good thing for like, if I were, if I had a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars and I wanted to do exactly what you're talking about, would I just go to your portal and, and um, get some of the resources to find those places where I could allocate those? Or are you saying it, it really doesn't matter with your portal? We, you can do that. I, I mean, I know I can do that by myself, but I'm just thinking about just getting into, into the space and having that education that's surrounding it. And not going to, you know, seed invest and not going over here and going over here, but having it all kind of within the same environment. Is that something that you offer, you know, incoming investors? So, so we put that on an email and we send it out. These are the opportunities you can go to. Having mm -hmm. done this, I can tell you and having a portal in the past and so forth is 95% of whatever happens, happens off that email. 5% happens on that portal. Hmm. I saw many people put their stuff up on a portal and then say, where everybody go? Well, unless you drive them there, they're not, they're not showing up. Right. And so what we found is we just moved it off the portal put it on an email and we put the buttons on the email. You can uh, get an introduction, you can follow the deal, you can pass and it's just all off the email because that's when it shows up, that's when you action it, that's when you do it. And then later if they want more information, we, we, we connect them to the entrepreneur to give them the diligence box and the answer to the questions and so forth. So we kind of moved away from the portal and moved it more to the email for that reason. That's great, that's really cool. Yeah. Like this it. has been really, really interesting stuff. Thank you for coming on the podcast, all. You bet, you bet. Yeah, you had a lot of fun with it. I've been doing this for uh, since 2009, and we changed the name to 10 Capital in 2016 when we were getting calls from outside of Texas wanting access to our network, and we carry on. And what we find is that, you know, there, there's so many different groups out there, uh, angels, VC, family offices were the traditional, but now there's crowdfunding groups, and then now there's blockchain groups, and now there's, Web3, you know, DAO groups that are coming up that we just keep curating the list and we actually have up to 18,000 investors in the network that are divided by revenue sector stage and type. I'd say half of them are technology based, 25% are healthcare life science. The other 25% are consumer product good and everything else, which we're seeing more climate tech and alternative energies coming in as well. Great, interesting. And Is your website 10tencapital.com? No, it's 10capital.group, uh, G-R-O-U-P. 
there's about a half dozen 10 capitals out there. There's a wealth advisor in Spokane, and there's an uh, advisory firm in uh, Chicago, and there's a REIT in uh, Atlanta, and we're all 10s. And so 10's uh, been around for a long time. I wanted to take Texas Entrepreneurs Network and make an acronym out of it and went, went with that, and uh, but gave up you know, exclusivity on the name. And so by the time I got there, I got the dot group uh, extension. Uh, but like I say, we're, we're pretty much, um, when people come to us, we, we work with them to help them get ready. We, we, we talk to them every week about their fundraise campaign, and we're doing uh, 15 events a, a month online and so forth. So we're, we're, we do a lot to help uh, startups and investors connect for funding and have a lot of fun with it. That's great. And so somebody could just go to your website if they want it as an investor, go to your website, sign up for the list is the very first kind of way to, to get involved, correct? Right. They have to say they're a credited investor. We, we, we do self-verification just like mm -hmm. uh, in the angel group. If you say you're accredited, we believe you, but you know, you can't sue anybody because you lost your money. Uh, but you know, that's, that's, that's the rules we operate under. Uh, we're, we're not a broker. We're not taking back in fees. So that gets us out of a lot of the compliance that usually comes with this. Sure. Fantastic. Sure. Yeah. This has been great, man. It's been well, thank great. you all. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you Hall. Great. We're well, glad to catch up with you guys today and uh, hope to uh, have a follow-up again soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. 10X for Gen XYZ is hosted by Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios, co-founders of Prosperity CRE, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and building long-term wealth. If you like the podcast, please give us a positive rating and subscribe to be notified about future content. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our approach to real estate investing, you can download a free copy of our real estate investment book, Investing for Cashflow and Long-Term Wealth, by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thank you and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes.